Good morning, everyone. My name is Jonathan Chan. I am the pastor at Crucible Church. Today, we will be going over the book of Ephesians as we continue on with our series entitled Paul's Prison Epistles, The New You. Last week, we went over the letter to the Colossians, and the previous week, Pastor Fritz went over the letter to the Philippians. So this week, we'll be going over the letter to the Ephesians, and I want to entitle it, The Armor. It's a popular passage, uh, armor passage, if you have been a Christian as long as I have. And uh, so if you can, if you have your Bibles with you or find a way to have access to scripture, we will uh, begin by reading Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 20. Finally, be strong to the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Verse 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of the evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people, Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. Why do we need the armor of God? You may ask, Paul, because if Paul wrote this letter back to you, us, our natural question would be to respond with, Why do we need this armor, Paul? Well, Paul then responds and says, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. We then ask and say, Paul, okay, what are those schemes? What do they look like? And Paul responds, well, obviously, it's not against the flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We go, okay, Paul. Really? What does that look like? What does powers of darkness, heavenly realms, spiritual forces of evil, what do they look like, Paul? So this morning, we will explore what is the purpose of this armor that Paul is referring to as God's armor, and what are the schemes that Paul is referring to that we need protection from. But before we go on and into this armor passage, we got to look at the first two chapters before it. If you are not aware of Ephesians, Ephesians is divided into two parts. The first part uh, is chapters 1 to 3, where Paul tells us who we are, what we have, and where we are going in Jesus Christ, as in the new you. Then in chapters 4 to 6, Paul tells us how to go about expressing our newness in Christ. A newness of life, a life after God's presence, a life following God's example. So these chapters should not be read as a bunch of do's and do nots. It should be read in light of chapters 1 to 3. Because Paul says, this is who you are now. This is the new you. Therefore, you can't help but follow God's example because that's who you are. So there's that therefore, the big therefore. In light of who you are, therefore, the newness we have, therefore, these things I'm going to tell you what to do, don't treat them as do's and do nots. They're not obligations. They're oozing out of you anyway. How do we know this? Well, the two lists that he gave started in chapters 4 and 5 started with a Greek word called hun, O-U-N. Hun means therefore. In other words, in Greek grammar, this therefore should be read like this. Therefore, because you are now in Christ, therefore, because you know who you are, where you're going, then 
live a life worthy of the calling you have received in chapter 4. Then in chapter 5, follow God's example. Walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. What are some of those things that he listed that should be oozing out of us because of our new life in Jesus? Well, in Ephesians chapter 4, he goes on and says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So as you can probably notice, these lists prior to the armor passage in chapter 6 had a lot to do with our direct interactions with human people. Well, human beings, sorry. Human beings around us. These lists show us what Christ-like character traits are supposed to be oozing out of us that we have in our possession now that we should have when we have direct contact with human beings. Now we come to the armor passage. Armor that our new selves have in our possession. But who or what are we equipped with this armor? Like what is this armor supposed to do? Who are we engaging with that we need this armor? Well, Paul gives us a hint, and it is found in chapter 6, verse 11 and 16. Put on the full armor of God, Paul says, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So it's the evil one, or the devil, more specifically, his schemes, also known as flaming arrows. This armor is to protect us from the devil's schemes because, hey, like one of my mentors once said, being a Christian is a full contact sport and we must be ready. But what are these schemes? What are these schemes trying to do? Paul gives us further hints and it's repeated by the word, and he repeats the word stand. And like we all know, anytime a word is repeated, it's important. Let's look at uh, verse, chapter 6, verse 11 again. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the devil's schemes. Verse 14, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and with the breastplate of righteousness in place. Stand firm. In other words, the opposite of the, the, synonymous, the synon, synonym for standing firm is to not stumble. Stumble from what? Interesting to note, the answer lies in Paul's references. And it may not be overtly mentioned in Ephesians, but Paul's armor of God is actually a footnote to another passage in the Old Testament found in Isaiah. And that is in Isaiah chapter 59. Let's go to it. In Isaiah 59, it begins that we could start out with verse 14. So justice is driven back and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets. Remember stumble, not to stumble, stand firm. Well, truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found, and whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. The Lord looked and was displeased, and there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. According to what they have done, so will he repay wrath to his enemies and retribution to his foes. He will pay the islands their due. So why did God put on an armor of uh, in Isaiah? Well, in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2, But your iniquities separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. His people, God's people, us, Israelites, God's chosen people, rebelled and turned away from him. We have a tendency, frequently, almost every day sometimes, to have a tendency to rebel against God. Back then in the Old Testament, Isaiah was referring, God was speaking through Isaiah to his people, saying that they incited revolt and oppression against God and lying to themselves, that they didn't need God, and that God was not trustworthy. And because they were convinced that they knew what was best for themselves, in God's eyes, their form of justice, their way of thinking of what's right and wrong, is actually no justice at all. 
because God continues with these words in Isaiah 59, 48. No one calls for justice. No one pleads a case with integrity. They rely on empty arguments. They utter lies. They conceive trouble and give birth to evil. And because of this blindness, their distorted view on justice sheds innocent blood, as noted at the verses above. Evil was born. The evil that Paul referred to in Ephesians as the spiritual powers, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, God is not saying that evil suddenly gave birth as if evil was never existent before this chapter. No, God is saying that evil rears its ugly head every time his people, we, reject him and turn our backs toward him. This evil and injustice is due to the lies that they believe, that we believe that God is not trustworthy and that God cannot sustain us. In Isaiah chapter 59, verse 14 to 15, so justice is driven back and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found. Nowhere to be found. And whoever shuns evil becomes the prey. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. No justice. No righteousness. No truth. No honesty. And those who stand against this type of chaos, well, they become prey. They get eaten up. There is absolutely no peace but complete chaos. The way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their paths. They have turned them into crooked roads. No one who walks along them will know peace. So God puts on this on his armor then. In response to this, God puts on his armor. There's no justice in light of this, all this entire chaos, no righteousness whatsoever, no peace. In response, God says, I am going to put my armor on. God's armor, we see in Isaiah, both protects and provides justice, righteousness, truth, and peace. This armor was to protect, but also liberate and free those who were in captivity by this evil. This armor was also the symbol of a promise, a promise that God will not depart from those who do stand firm and hold on to him. And this promise lasts forever. What is this promise? Well, it's found in verse 20 of Isaiah 59. The Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in the Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you will not depart from you. And my words that I have put in your mouth will always be on your lips, on the lips of your children, on the lips of their descendants, from this time on and forever, says the Lord. Now we know what God's armor was for in Isaiah. How does this apply then? How do we make the connection then from Isaiah to Paul's God's armor in Ephesians? Remember, Paul made the reference from Ephesians saying that, hey, I'm using Isaiah here. I'm using God's armor reference in Isaiah. Well, we should ask Paul and say, why did you do that? Now that we know what God's armor was for in Isaiah, Paul, how does this apply to your letter in Ephesians, we ask? Well, this is what he says. Paul says that the reason why we put on the armor of God in Ephesians is to stand against the devil's schemes and stand firm or in Isaiah's passage, he says, shun against evil. This armor, as long as it's in your possession, Paul says, as long as you hold on to it tightly, he says, and believe in God's armor's capacity to protect and fulfill the promise that he has made, we will not stumble. We will not turn away from God. We will not believe in the lies that we do not need God and turn away from him. And we do, will not believe that God is untrustworthy. By holding on to his armor, we stand firm, and it's, we stand firm by not giving in to the lies of the evil one. So this armor, this armor of God, behaves the same way as the armor in Isaiah. It is to protect us from being persuaded by the devil's schemes, to turn away from God, and it is also as an offensive to attack, to actually dismantle and diffuse the attacks of the devil and, uh, and to protect, to provide justice for those who do stand firm. So it's not only to protect, but also to provide justice, to provide justice on behalf of those who do stand firm. So 
Now we know about this armor. So let's take a look at each individual piece of armor that Paul lists. First one, belt of truth. Remember that the Israelites believed in a lie that they didn't need God? The truth is, they did. God, because God, they needed God. They didn't know what was right and wrong. Their entire moral and ethical compass was distorted because they rejected God, thinking that they had the truth and not God. We believe that the gospel of Jesus is true. The virgin birth, his crucifixion, his death and resurrection. We believe that because he rose from the dead, we too rise from the dead and that we have new life. We also believe that the same God who rose from Jesus from the dead is the same God we believe today. And therefore, we do need him. He is our sustainer, our provider, and we follow in his example for that, for, because he will sustain us. The same God who has the immense power, power enough to resurrect a person, is the same God that we believe will sustain us. We cannot reject him. He is our provider. That's the truth. Breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness, righteousness here means justice. And we hold on to the truth that God is the ultimate judge and executioner. Being a Christian is quite difficult at times. We are called to be humble, to love one another, to love our neighbors, to be patient, to not look out for ourselves, but look out for the other people's interests, to sacrifice, make sacri personal sacrifices for the common good, and not to go after the things of the world. That is tough especially in Vancouver. We are bombarded with so much noise telling us that we need to get onto the housing market, telling us that we are falling behind every single day, that it is very difficult to remove our self-centeredness and place ourselves into other-centeredness. But God says this, don't worry, all these voices will be gone. All these voices will be judged and they will not hinder us, and they will not make us stumble. God, the breastplate of righteousness, this is the breastplate of justice. The gospel of peace, I liken it to be like the Nikes, because in this passage, Paul says it's actually fitted on our feet. We are peacemakers. Vengeance is God's responsibility, not ours. Notice though that I said Nikes, meaning that notice that the peace is the shoes. In Isaiah, remember that the people, I quote, did not know the way to walk in peace. When our peace is grounded in the gospel, literally in our feet, there will be unity among us, which means that we can help and support one another and fend off the devil's schemes. We can't do it alone. We need to do it in community. That is why we, have, we gather as a community of believers to remind each other that we are for each other. We are, with, we are partnered with each other and we are journeying life together. No one goes out facing the devil's schemes on their own. We need to support each other and pray for one another. I will get back to the importance of community later. But for now, we must remember that we need to be the way of peace. We are the peacemakers in this place. And next week, I will be talking about Philemon and how we need to be the agents of reconciliation. In Ephesians chapters, in the next passage, is shield of faith. My apologies. The next unit of, the next piece of armor is called the shield of faith. And it is the arrows may take form I quote from uh, N.T. Wright's commentary. He says, The arrows may take form of despair, doubt, tough circumstances, and tragedies. Or the arrows can come in victories that tempt us to boast and be prideful. Either way, he goes on, faith is loyalty. And if we remain loyal to God, he will continue to keep his promise of remaining with us and his spirit present among us forever. So, Back to the points of being a Vancouverite, we are consistently, like consistently being bombarded, bombarded, but telling us with voices telling us that we are falling behind, that we should get ahead, that the corporate ladder is outpacing us, the housing prices are outpacing us, and our children are need to get better and better and better because it's a competitive world out there. It's tough. Also, sickness happens. Illnesses happen, sufferings happen, 
tough circumstances happen. Our careers, we, have, we experience stresses in our careers. We, exp- we experience stresses in our family relationships. If you are like me, I'm in the sandwich generation where I have a child to take care of, but I also have my aging parents to take care of. We have difficult circumstances. Each and every one of us have difficult circumstances to take care of. Not one of us can judge the other on the saying that, oh, my sufferings are, are more than yours. No, everybody is given their amount of sufferings that they can handle. But in the midst of suffering, the biggest test, the devil uses these sufferings and test us. Test us to say, do you think that God is with you through the suffering? Are you confident? Or it might be just better to just fall back to your old selves, the devil says. We cannot be tempted to do that. The new selves, the new, the new person that we have, the new life that we have in Christ is much more worthwhile, much more better than the, our old selves. And that is something that we need to be reminded of all the time. That, that when we remain loyal with God, He will fight with us and fight for us on all these difficult circumstances we encounter. Next one, the helmet of salvation. Notice that it's helmet, which means that it's something to remember. Salvation. Remember who we are. We are saved ones in Jesus Christ, loved by God. In other words, death has no grip on us anymore. We have eternal life. We have freedom from this, the death. We, have, we are freedom from the chains of death. We are freedom from our old self's tendencies so that we have freedom for our new self, our new life. Freedom to do other things, good things, things that bless others. So our helmet of salvation is actually we need to remember who we are in Christ. Save peoples in Jesus Christ, loved by God, and death has no grip on us. Now, what are we to use to fight the devil then? How are we to retaliate? Just like Jesus in the desert, while the evil one tempted him three times, what do we have? Well, we do the same thing as he did. First, Jesus goes to God's word, holds on to God's promise. And what is that promise? Isaiah 59, verse 20 to 21. The Redeemer will come to Zion. To those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord, As for me, this is my promise with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you will not depart from you. And my words that I have put in your mouth will always be on your lips, on the lips of your children, on the lips of their descendants, from this time on forever, says the Lord. If we stand firm against the temptation of going back to our old selves, if we stand and endure, continue the struggle and run the race in allowing the Holy Spirit to consume us, with our newfound selves, God promises, and we hold on to this promise, that He will deliver us, that He will not depart from us, which means He will fight with us and actually fight for us. That is an awesome promise. One song that we sang this morning goes on and says, If God is for us, who can stand against us? What a promise. That's the sword. The sword is God's promise. Lastly, the final offensive weapon is to pray. Why? Because when we pray, stuff happens. We don't know how or why, but stuff does happen. And we believe this. We pray for each other and for ourselves that God will enable us, enable us to stand firm. That God enables us to continually allow the Holy Spirit to consume us, fill us, and help us allow our new selves to break out. But there's more to just prayer than just praying for ourselves individually. When we pray together as a church, when we pray for each member, when we pray for each other, our neighbors that are sitting, who are sitting beside us, unity is formed. It means that through prayer, we are saying to each other that I am also with you. I am joining with you in your life journey. You're not alone for the next six days. I will be with you. I am praying with you and we will fight together along with God's presence with us. No one is alone, facing the devil's schemes alone. When we pray, 
we are in, we are saying to each other that we are in this together. No one goes out alone and and face the devil schemes on their own. You know, our new self is highly dependent on other people around us in our, the community that we have among us. So, what better way to be reminded of who we are than to be meeting with people to remind us of who we are? And I would like to show you a video on the importance of community and how community helps us to stand firm and not stumble and go back to our old selves. And this uh, uh, video is actually taken from a movie called Freedom Riders. So let's go to it. Ms. G, carry something from my diary? That'd be great. Been with us since freshman year, fool. What's his name? I don't know. The summer was the worst summer in my short 14 years of life. It all started with a phone call. My mother was crying and begging, asking for more time, as if she were gasping for her last breath of air. She helped me as tight as she could and cried. Her tears hit my shirt like bullets told me we were being evicted. She kept apologizing to me. I thought I have no home. I should have asked for something less expensive at Christmas. On the morning of the eviction, a hard knock on the door woke me up. The sheriff was there to do his job. I looked up at the sky, waiting for something to happen. My mother has no family to lean on, no money coming in. Why bother coming to school or getting good grades if I'm homeless? The bus stops in front of the school. I feel like throwing up. I'm wearing clothes from last year. Some old shoes and no new haircut. I kept thinking I'd get laughed at. Instead, I'm greeted by a couple of friends who were my English class last year. And it hits me. Mrs. Gurwa, my crazy English teacher from last year, is the only person that made me think of hope. Talking with friends about last year's English and our trips, I began to feel better. I received my schedule and the first teacher is Mrs. Gerwan, room 203. I walk into the room and feel as though all the problems in life are not so important anymore. I am home. Crucible Church, or if you're watching this, you may not be part of a crucible church, but maybe part of another faith community, or you're looking for a faith community. When you enter church, when you enter on a Sunday service, do you feel at home? Do you feel that all the problems that you were experiencing throughout the past week, they don't really matter anymore when you come to church, when you're amongst a community of people who have new life just like you? Life is tough. Life is sometimes gets, part of my French, shitty. It could be a shithole. And, you know, with all that stuff being bombarded as backstabbing, uh, rumors, gossip, work politics, uh, overwhelming boss or even a disengaged boss, and it's just the rat race of life. Throughout those uh, six days, just problems just continue to hit you. And it is so tempting, so tempting to just forget about God and say, God's not here. God's not with me. Can he really be trusted? But when we hit Sunday and when we go to our faith community, when we go and meet with our friends in our community and we worship God and pray for one another and listen to the word of God and God reminding us through his word of who we are in Jesus and reminding us of the truth that death has no sting and that we have eternal life and that nothing can be against us if God is with us. If God is with us, who can be against us? What encouragement. What encouragement for us to know that the people around us, our neighbors sitting beside us, 
are saying to us as we pray together that we are not alone, that everyone is for each other, that you are not alone because I'm with you through the rest of this week. And you can bet on it that I will continue to keep you in my prayers till we meet again next Sunday. One encouragement. One encouragement because that's who we are. Our new life in Christ is also a new life in community. If you're not feeling at home at Crucible Church, or you're not feeling at home in your faith community, or you're not feeling at home, or you're just looking for a home like this, let me pray with you. Contact me. Connect with me after service up at the front. Allow me to join with you. Allow me to be the first person, maybe, to say, I'm with you. And that I will journey with you through the next six days. And I will continue to pray with you. And pray with you. Not, not so much of praying a whole list of to-dos and the whole wish list. More like praying saying that, you know what? The life, the, the life happens. And when it does, know full well that you're not alone. Praise God. Amen. Well, that is it for that today. Uh, next week, we'll be going on to Philemon. And so, have a blessed week and hope to see you next Sunday.